on hydrogen accelerator and what steps uh, should be taken really to, to, to accelerate this hydrogen development. And the recent uh, announcement about stopping gas supply to Poland and Bulgaria definitely even more uh, accelerates and focus our needs really to, to how we and other short time. Uh, today's event will be opened by Kitty Nitrai. She's head of unit of the commission. We will not uh, torture her because I know that her team is working extremely hard preparing the measures that should be announced by commission in, in May. So, but really we are very glad that Kitty is here. Uh, and the main course is Alejandro Nunez uh, Jimenez. Uh, he, together with Nicola de Blasio, wrote a report that gives at least for me a lot of courage how to proceed. It is called the report, The Future of Renewable Hydrogen in the European Union. And then we will have a panel debate uh, moderated by my colleague, Ilaria Conte, uh, where I believe the crucial players uh, are uh, involved uh, Yorgos Chatsimarkakis, who is a leader of Hydrogen Europe, uh, Timo Bollerley, uh, Bollerle, uh, uh, H2 Global, Timo, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry for wrongly pronouncing, but I will come better, and Roland Rush from IRENA. Uh, and uh, the conclusions will be done by my colleague, Christopher Jones. So we will start now immediately. And Kitty, uh, the floor is yours for opening. Thank you very much, Andris. And thank you very much really for inviting me to this conference. Um, as you said, indeed, there's not much uh, that I can reveal concretely. And for the simple reason, not because I don't want to, but because of the simple reason that we are still working on all of this. Um, and it's very much work in process. So, um, maybe to start with, indeed, luckily, and, and ex post, you can even see the higher value of the things, we don't start from zero, because in 2020, we have adopted our first hydrogen strategy, the, the EU hydrogen strategy, so we do have a good basis to, to start from, so we already laid down the policy direction, we identified what needs to be done um, in order to, to really use hydrogen for the full decarbonization of the economy. So we identified the necessary actions, how to scale up demand and supply in parallel. We established the Clean Hydrogen Alliance in order to help also to bring the uh, industry aboard, on board. We have done a lot in the meantime in the regulatory front because we have uh, started with the new proposal for the 10 e regulation, which in the meantime has already been negotiated um, and is in the process of, uh, of um, adoption because it's been finalized in the meantime, which will include already hydrogen infrastructures among the categories that can become projects of common interest at the EU level. So that piece of the puzzle uh, is, will be soon law in, uh, in, in, in the EU level. We have in the meantime tabled the Renewable Energy Directive that sets out concrete targets for the different sectors, especially in industry and transport, in order to create a pull factor for hydrogen into the economy and especially into the hard to decarbonize sectors. Um, and with the end of the year, we have also delivered or put on the table of the Council and the Parliament, especially for negotiations, the new market rules in order to give a vision and um, an investor certainty to um, how the market, the hydrogen market should work in the future so that people can trust the system and can make the necessary investment. So we have progressed a lot in the regulatory framework and that's now of course all in the negotiations. At the same time, of course, uh, February has changed again everything. So with the unprovoked invasion of, uh, of Ukraine by Russia, we had to take an ever closer look on what we can do in order to accelerate the EU's, um, uh, the EU's getting away from, from fossil fuels. And just as a reminder, uh, the EU is hugely dependent on Russia for energy supplies and fossil fuel supplies in particular, 54% for, for coal, 29% uh, for, for oil and 45% uh, for uh, natural gas. So, 
it's 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 huge and it's um it's really it, we, we need to do everything we can in order to replace replace those fuels and of course clean energy technologies are the solution so basically what we have to do is to is to go ahead even quicker than we than than we than we have been doing so far on the clean energy agenda and on the green deal, green deal priorities so so we have to go um, even even uh, faster and all the all the investments that we are planning and of course hydrogen is one of the key areas for accelerating and that's why you have seen in the march communication the hydrogen um, the hydrogen accelerator as 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 an and taking our hydrogen strategy so to say to the to the next step so when we drafted the hydrogen strategy we thought it was already ambitious enough but then with the new uh with the new um circumstances we have to go even one step further so just to start with a couple of figures as you know in the hydrogen um, strategy we have started 40 gigawatt of electrolyzer um, capacity target for 2030. We had some intermediate targets before. Uh, and when we tabled the rest, red proposal, so the Renewable Energy Directive, that took us to about 5.6 uh, million tons of renewable hydrogen in, in the identified sectors. Now we have to go quicker because we have to accelerate the, the replacement of, of, of Russian fossil fuels in our mix. And very often hydrogen is put uh, to replace or is assumed to replace uh, natural gas. And this is true, uh, especially in ammonia production and, and in some sectors, but actually hydrogen doesn't always replace just natural gas. It can replace coal, so coking coal, especially in the steel sector, it can replace oil in the transport sector. So hydrogen is not just a replacement for natural gas, it's true decarbonization option. So we really need to do everything that's in our power to, to go quicker uh, on, on this. So what, what are we looking at? Because of course, our next milestone in policy terms is the 18th of May, which is the Repar EU plan when we have to um, come up with the next set of measures or actions or proposals that can uh, that can uh, implement this, this vision that, that came with the communication in March. So we are exactly very much working on this. So it is very timely for me also to listen to our panelists and to see and to get some more inspiration of which are those areas where we can act quicker, where we can act faster and where we can do more. Uh, so we definitely, we need a quicker scaling up. So from the 5.6 uh, million tons, we need to uh, look more into 10 million tons uh, production within the EU. And uh, with this March communication, we have also made a more concrete com commitment to imports of hydrogen. Luckily, in the meantime, and today we will see another great example for this, there are more and more studies becoming available about what hydrogen imports could look like. So it is uh, what from what we can see today, it will be a mix between imports via pipelines from the neighborhood, but also imports in the form of ammonia, uh, so renewable ammonia and possible other options in the long term. So what we need to look at is how can we accelerate this process? How can we make uh, make sure that the right infrastructures are there, both, both in terms of pipelines, as well as in terms of port infrastructures and terminals, so that, uh, so that um, amount of, um, of, of hydrogen can be welcomed in the EU, but not only because, of course, all this production in our partner countries doesn't yet exist. So we also have to step up all our partnerships with uh, at the international level in order to allow uh, these investments to happen. So these investments to happen in those uh, partner countries with whom the EU would like to engage in a longer term and to establish uh, broader clean energy partnerships. And of course, when we look at the March communication, we are very much looking into, into the, the um, partnerships and also to the global EU uh, hydrogen facility in order to um, try to support those uh, developments also concretely from the Commission side to, to help the coordination and the risk mitigation that such uh, big endeavors will, will require. So um, we will do also a couple of other implementing measures or, or measures that we hope will, will help um, the, um, the achievement of these goals. 
and um, we try to address a lot of the barriers that in the meantime have been identified since the hydrogen strategy has come out, notably also by the Clean Hydrogen Alliance. Um, and one of the measures is definitely authorization procedures. And this is not only relevant for hydrogen specific infrastructure, but very much so for the renewable generation that is required in order to produce the, the renewable hydrogen. So in, in our May package, we will also put forward uh, proposals how to, how to uh, um, accelerate these authorization procedures uh, and how to deliver quicker the renewables that we need in order to reduce our dependency on fossil fuels from, uh, from, uh, from Russia in particular. So all this is very much ongoing and we are very, very happy to, to hear uh, all stakeholders' views and all the input and all the studies that we can get to see what, what we can do more, what we can do better. So very happy to be here today and thanks a lot. Thank you, Kitty, for excellent introduction. And now, uh, Alejandro, the floor is yours. So uh, uh, we would we wait with anticipation your your uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anders. It's a pleasure to be with everyone here today. Let me share my slides. Okay. Okay. There we go. So good afternoon, everyone in Europe and good morning uh, in the US where I reach uh, from you today. Uh, my name is Alejandro Nunez Jimenez and I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the Harvard uh, Kennedy School in the Belfast Center. Today, I wanna um, introduce you to a recent report that my colleague, um, Nicola de Blasio, who is a senior fellow also at the Belfast Center and I uh, published in March. It's called the future of renewable hydrogen in the European Union. And in this presentation, um, I will first touch upon what is the picture today for hydrogen, what motivated us to write this report and then dive into the results of the report. If you wanna read it in full, you can go to the Belfast Center website where you can read it and uh, download it. So to begin with, um, I like to touch on two reasons why I think there are so much excitement about hydrogen today. On the one hand, uh, expectations for high demand for clean hydrogen in the near uh, future. And on the other hand, a clean hydrogen production gap that is becoming more and more uh, visible. So if we look into the projections of the International Energy Agency with the net zero emissions scenario, we see that global hydrogen demand could multiply by six between today and 2050, if countries are to meet the emission reduction targets that they've set for themselves. This would mean that um, demand for hydrogen would jump from around 90 million tons of hydrogen today to something like 530 million tons of hydrogen, mainly driven by new hydrogen uses to decarbonize sectors such as transportation, power generation, ammonia as a fuel, synthetic fuels, buildings, et cetera, which uh, demand for which will come on top of all the hydrogen uses, for example, in chemicals, refining, and steel making. So this is one of the legs uh, why there is so much excitement about hydrogen, the expectation that to meet emission reduction, we'll need a lot more clean hydrogen than today. The other is that hydrogen production today is still part of the problem. Sources of hydrogen production today rely very heavily on fossil fuels, particularly natural gas without carbon capture, utilization and storage, and coal. The production of hydrogen today uh, emits the equivalent of the combined emissions of Indonesia and the United Kingdom, which is a lot. And this is also a problem in Europe where you can see the um, production capacity it's very unevenly distributed across member states, but it's very heavily reliant on natural gas with the steam methane reforming being three quarters of uh, production capacity of hydrogen in the EU and coal coking contributing to uh, 14%. Clean hydrogen production in the EU, it's very small. Um, this is with data from 2020, and it would represent something like 0.5% of the total. So still a very a small basis. If we compare 
um, if we compare the planned projects for blue hydrogen, um, which is the steam methane reforming plus CCUS, and green hydrogen or renewable hydrogen that are planned today with the needs that the International Energy Agency estimates until 2050 to meet emission target emission reduction targets, we see that even though the production of clean hydrogen is expected to grow very quickly, it is not growing fast enough to avoid the appearance of this clean hydrogen production gap that by 2030 could be larger than today's total production of hydrogen. So the second leg um, of all the excitement about hydrogen is that we might need a lot of it and the clean production is not growing fast enough, so it needs to be faster. And this led us to the main question of our uh, report, which is where will the European Union obtain competitive and secure renewable hydrogen supplies from in the long term? As we all know, hydrogen enjoys unprecedented momentum worldwide, and Europe is at the forefront of the global hydrogen race. Last summer, McKinsey estimated that there are something like 360 announced large-scale projects. There's probably a lot more today that if realized would account for $500 billion of investment by 2030. And most of them, actually 80% of them, are uh, in Europe, located in Europe. So Europe is doing, uh, is attracting a lot of the projects that are being announced. But we argue that to stay ahead, the European Union will need a cohesive long-term strategy to develop competitive and secure hydrogen markets. And this idea comes from a previous work from my colleague, uh, Dr. Nicola de Blasio and Friedolin Fluchmann on the geopolitics of renewable hydrogen in low carbon uh, energy markets. They took into account the renewable energy resources, water availability, land availability, competing demand, infrastructure potential across uh, many different countries and classify them into five groups that I like to summarize in three. Group one are countries that could produce a lot more renewable hydrogen that they would need, so they could become global exporters of uh, renewable hydrogen. Groups two, three, and five are countries that are somehow constrained in, so, in how much uh, renewable hydrogen they could produce. And group four are countries that are renewable rich, have a high potential to develop infrastructure, um, but they don't have uh, the same potential as uh, export champions and thus um, might not become global exporters. If we zoom in into Europe, we see that most European Union countries are resource constrained, but there are a few who could become regional exporters. At the same time, uh, there are neighbor export champions like uh, Morocco, who are well situated to supply the EU with competitive renewable hydrogen. And there are also long distance export champions that could mitigate security of supply concerns. So the European Union um, faces um, different, have countries in the European Union have different um, profiles of, and how they could deal with the, uh, scaling up renewable hydrogen production. And there are different options of how the bloc could uh, try to address them. As uh, Nikki was saying before, last summer in July, 2020, the EU hydrogen strategy came out and presented renewable hydrogen as key for reaching climate neutrality. And I want to highlight uh, four takeaways. The first is that the European Union puts renewable hydrogen as the key priority, while other ways to obtain clean hydrogen are seen as interim uh, solutions, but not long-term objectives. It sets uh, deployment targets for electrolyzers that would amount to a production of around 10 million tons of hydrogen by 2030, which is roughly today's hydrogen demand in Europe. But there are no targets after 2030. It's also important uh, for the context of our report to mention that within the EU strategy, there are aspirations for an open and competitive EU hydrogen market and the recognition that hydrogen opens new opportunities for redesigning Europe's energy partnerships. Also, as Nikki was saying before, um, but this came out after our report was published. On March 8th, 
2022. So just a few weeks ago, the European Commission um, published the communication on repower EU plan in a very different context from the um, um, original hydrogen strategy. I just want to highlight three things uh, very quickly. First is this increase in ambition for uh, renewable hydrogen targets for 2030 from um, 5.6 in the fit for 55 uh, package to 20, uh, where 10 million tons are expected to come from imports and 10 million tons from production in the EU. All new gas infrastructure must be hydrogen ready, including cross-border connections. And there is a goal to accelerate the switch to hydrogen in industry, including a mention to EU-wide uh, contracts for carbon contracts for difference. Within the report, we assess the, the original EU strategy, but I think it's also fair to extend this to this communique that this EU strategy lays as the foundations for an EU hydrogen economy, um, but leave the door open to different views of what future hydrogen markets may look like after 2030. And to explore how these uh, markets uh, could look like and their implications, we work with three scenarios in which the EU prioritizes different strategic variables. The first one, the EU puts the priority on energy independence and the scenario is called hydrogen independence. Only internal production of renewable hydrogen is considered. The second one, the priority is to optimize costs. It's called regional imports and the EU um, um, considers internal production of renewable hydrogen and regional and imports from regional neighbors. In the third scenario, the priority is energy security and cost. It's called long distance imports. And besides regional imports, internal production, the EU also considers um, long distance imports, uh, for example, from Australia and the United States. Each of these scenarios is investigated with three steps in our report. And um, the first one is whether there would be enough renewable hydrogen to meet demand in each scenario? How costly would it be to produce renewable hydrogen in each of these scenarios? And finally, we develop a model to optimize trade and identify what are key trade routes to keep supply costs low. The final piece uh, in the method for this report was to uh, project future EU hydrogen demand. Um, this is very uncertain at the moment, and you can find estimates that range very widely. And also there was no consumption target set in the EU strategy. So what we did, we went to national hydrogen uh, strategies in key EU countries and come up with an assumption of 15% um, of primary energy for 2050. And uh, as you can see, this leads us to a projected demand of around 76 million tons of hydrogen uh, per year, which is middle of the ground compared to, uh, middle of the road compared to recent um, literature. All right, so we have all the pieces of the method that we have used, and now I can jump uh, into the results. The first result uh, that we find uh, is that all the scenarios are viable pathways to meet long-term EU hydrogen demand. When we uh, look into the renewable hydrogen potential across different countries and we plot it into a map, what we observe is that there is no EU country that can become an export champion. Um, this is a confirmation of our previous result in, in the geopolitical um, uh, map of renewable hydrogen. But we can also observe that there are some member states in the periphery of the EU that have the highest potentials, particularly Spain in the south, but also uh, Ireland or Denmark. And um, the final thing that we can observe from um, renewable hydrogen potentials is that regional and long distance partners like Morocco or Australia and the United States on the right have renewable hydrogen potentials that are orders of magnitude higher than any of the EU countries. So they could uh, contribute very substantially to EU demand. One important consideration when looking at um, renewable hydrogen potentials is that 
to become hydrogen independent, the European Union would have to develop a very large internal market for hydrogen so that um, production in some countries compensate for the lack of uh, potential in other countries. When we add up together all the uh, renewable hydrogen potential across the EU, we find that eight EU countries would account for 80% of renewable hydrogen potential, meaning that it's relatively concentrated within a few countries. If we compare the potential against the estimated or the projected demand in 2050, we see that internal EU trade must cover at least two thirds of hydrogen demand. So two thirds of EU consumption of renewable hydrogen would have to be produced in one member state, transported to another what it would be uh, consumed. If it is not, around 15 EU countries could face production gaps, meaning their ability to produce renewable hydrogen domestically um, could be smaller than potential demand uh, in 2050. With this in mind, uh, we now turn into how costly it would be to produce this renewable hydrogen. And one of the findings that we have is that production costs uh, depend on how much renewable hydrogen pr uh, production you have. This is what we call production cost curves. On the horizontal axis, you have how much hydrogen, you, how much renewable hydrogen you produce, and on the vertical axis, how costly it is. And what happens is that if you organize the renewable hydrogen potentials that you have in a country from the most competitive to the least competitive, they create this uh, cost curves. What we find in the European Union is that a production cost could range um, rather widely. And if you take only the most competitive resources to meet EU demand in 2050, the average cost of production without transportation costs could be something like $3.5 per kilogram. If we look outside the EU, we see similar ranges for uh, production costs but there is a lot more potential to produce at a lower cost. And this results in an average cost for meeting EU demand, again, without taking into account transportation costs of almost $1 per kilogram less. Um, one um, additional uh, takeaway is that when we consider the potential of different countries to produce renewable hydrogen, we need to consider also how this uh, curve looks like. What is the shape? If it's rather flat, as we see, for example, for, from Spain on the top left, it means that production of renewable hydrogen could increase a lot without uh, making it more expensive. While other countries, like um, a little bit uh, down in Denmark on the left, uh, we see that there is a jump from as you increase uh, production of renewable hydrogen. And the reason is simple, because you start uh, using the best resources you have in the country, and the more you produce, the more you have to use other resources that are not so good. So not as windy or not as shiny, uh, not, a, not that much sun. So then it becomes more expensive to produce. And this could uh, be important to assessing how much each country can contribute. Okay. So now the main results from the trade optimization uh, is that imports of renewable hydrogen could lower supply costs by 6 to 12 percent. For this, we consider transportation costs. And because it's very uncertain how um, large scale hydrogen will be transported in the future, we consider two alternatives, pipelines and liquefied hydrogen shipping or pipelines and ammonia shipping. In both cases, and this is important, um, we consider that at the end point, at the arrival, um, both liquefied hydrogen is regasified into uh, gas hydrogen and ammonia is converted back to hydrogen. This increases the cost of transportation for ammonia, which are nonetheless lower um, than liquefied hydrogen in all our scenarios. All right, so looking at the total cost, production and transportation costs for all the scenarios, we find that supply costs could range between three and four dollars per kilogram. Long distance imports would not provide 
uh, additional cost reduction opportunities because even though it's cheaper to produce renewable hydrogen in some of those uh, faraway countries, the additional cost of transportation would offset their advantage. And another takeaway from this uh, results is that ammonia shipping always lowers supply costs for two reasons. One, transportation is cheaper than liquefied hydrogen. And second, because transportation is cheaper, it allows you to import more um, uh, renewable hydrogen from cheaper um, um, production locations, from cheaper countries. The other combined effect is that in all scenarios, we see that transporting hydrogen with ammonia would be a better option. Now, how do the uh, trade routes uh, look like in its scenario? In the hydrogen independence scenario, we see that countries uh, in Central Europe would rely on countries in the periphery of the European Union to compensate for their low um, production potentials. So we see that um, hydrogen would be produced mainly in the Iberian Peninsula, Spain and Portugal, but also in the Baltic States and Denmark and send mainly to, um, to Central European countries. Uh, we can see Germany as one of the biggest destinations for renewable hydrogen. All in all, the lowest cost uh, option would be to increase internal EU trade up to 70% of EU demand. So maximizing the opportunities from internal um, EU trade of renewable hydrogen. And for this, it would be necessary to have uh, the infrastructure ready. And this would mean, in this case, pipelines from um, the Iberian Peninsula and the Baltic states towards Central Europe, uh, also including uh, from Denmark. We also see that Ireland, if it wanted to exploit the uh, great wind resources they have, could contribute significantly to um, hydrogen independence of the European Union. Um, one last thing from this slide is that most of the hydrogen trade would be through pipelines, uh, which explains why the model doesn't show a big difference, whether uh, shipping is done with liquefied or uh, liquefied hydrogen or ammonia. In the next, and that's different in the next cases. So for regional imports, um, they can lower supply costs, but um, but only if uh, imports from non-EU countries are very substantial. Here we see that there is a big difference between liquefied hydrogen shipping and ammonia shipping. Imports from non-EU countries would supply 62% of EU demand with liquefied hydrogen shipping. But if we have ammonia shipping, which is cheaper, imports would rise to 84%. The two key uh, countries contributing to this um, imports of renewable hydrogen would be Morocco and Norway, especially if ammonia shipping is available, Morocco would be very dominant. And this could create some concerns about relying on only a few uh, partners for most of the uh, hydrogen needs of the European Union and reproduce past patterns of energy dependence um, similar to the ones that are have become uh, so prominent uh, recently. So how could this be addressed? Well, in the last scenario, we look at what would happen if we add, if the European Union considers long distance imports, and this would help diversify imports costs effectively, but only if shipping becomes competitive. So what we see again is a big difference, whether we have liquefied hydrogen shipping or ammonia shipping, with liquefied hydrogen shipping, uh, things to stay more or less the same as in the previous scenario, because sending hydrogen from the United States or even Australia, um, it's not uh, competitive in the EU market. If ammonia shipping is available, imports from the United States uh, become uh, competitive, not from Australia because they are, um, it's too costly because it's too far away and could not compete. And we see again that between 63% and 83% of EU demand, depending on this uh, shipping technology, um, would be met from imports from outside the EU. The key takeaway is that by 
considering long distance partners like the United States, the reliance on one on any single producer of renewable hydrogen of the European Union would be 20% or lower. So the European Union would have a chance to diversify its uh, providers of renewable hydrogen while maintaining total costs uh, low. But of course, to make uh, any of this a scenario a reality, there would have to be um, very large investments. We estimate them to be in the order of $2 trillion until 2050, and they would be distributed like this. Over 80% of the investments would be needed for producing renewable hydrogen, uh, mainly for renewable electricity and electrolyzers in all a scenario. In those uh, scenarios with imports, um, the total investment would go down by nine to 13%, but more investment would be needed in transportation infrastructure, as we see with the uh, orange column. Another important takeaway is that the location of these imports would change depending on the scenario that the European Union uh, pursues. Um, if it wants to rely or if, if it pursues regional uh, imports on long distance imports, there would be between 60 and 80% of investments located outside uh, the European Union. And finally, because um, technologies around hydrogen are moving very quickly and um, some of our assumptions might have been already, uh, might all already look a bit old, uh, we conducted a very comprehensive sensitivity analysis. And what we found is that the ranking of the S scenarios remain the same and they're very different technology cost assumptions. So what we see in this graph is that the change in supply costs, which is the um, on the horizontal axis where the bar moves to, um, it's very similar across all uh, scenarios. So the differences between them would remain under very different uh, technology cost assumptions. Some other interesting takeaways from this sensitivity analysis is that the cost of capital has the largest impact on the cost of renewable hydrogen. Uh, we use 88% as our uh, central assumption, uh, taking it from the International Energy Agency. But if we use 4% as a lower cost of capital, the uh, total supply cost would drop uh, to $2.5 to $3 per kilogram. We also uh, find a switch effect, um, which is very interesting because essentially it says that if you look at the um, results for wind energy and solar energy, the column or the bar towards the right, it's smaller than towards the left. So this means that if a renewable technology, it's more expensive than we expect, suppliers will turn to others. So if solar is more expensive, they will turn to wind. And if wind is more expensive, they will turn to solar. And this would limit how, um, how much the uh, cost of supplying renewable hydrogen would increase. While if any of them becomes cheaper than we expect, um, suppliers will use it more. So this is why the left side of this bar is bigger. Finally, um, there is a big debate about uh, refurbishing um, natural gas pipelines um, for using hydrogen. We consider very uh, conservatively that all the pipelines built would be new um, but in the sensitivity analysis, we consider what would happen if pipelines were 50% cheaper or 50% more expensive. And as you can see, it doesn't have a very large impact on total supply costs, um, moving the needle only between two, 1% and 2%. Okay, so that was uh, all for my results. Some uh, policy implications that we derived from the report is that for accelerating renewable hydrogen adoption at scale. Some uh, um, recommendations for policymakers is to lower market risk and try to remove these barriers that uh, Kitty was mentioning before so that this uh, economy as a scale that is needed to unlock these technology cost reductions are achieved.
define clear policies to stimulate a strong renewables uh, growth. We've seen that most of the investment would be needed to produce this uh, renewable hydrogen uh, production. And it's particularly important to focus on countries that have the biggest potentials and could become regional exporters for the union. Continue to fund innovation and pilot projects to lower technology costs, coordinate the enabling infrastructure development um, based on optimal, optimized flows, um, as we showed with the optimization for trade. And finally, harmonize standards and regulations so that this uh, market can actually start to emerge and hydrogen can flow uh, seamlessly across borders. If the European Union um, chooses to go with regional imports and long distance imports, there will be additional considerations like long term contracts and direct investments, transparent regulations, and promoting international standards so that everyone um, can be certain that um, it's actually clean hydrogen that is being produced and traded. Okay. So I, I hope I didn't go uh, too quickly. That's um, all from my side. I just want to acknowledge uh, all the people at the Harvard Kennedy School that are involved with this um, project, this initiative on hydrogen. Nicola de Blasio, who is leading it, is a senior fellow here at the ENRP and STPV programs, the director of the program, Henry Lee, um, myself, and my colleague, Freedom Flukman. If you want to know more, just find us on our uh, website and Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Alejandro, for excellent presentation. It's really very comprehensive. Um, I would now draw to uh, panelists. So do you have any questions or any challenges to ask for Alejandro? Would you would disagree with his assessment? I know that it was not your task really to look what is, what is correct or not, but what strikes as strange or quite opposite, something that is extremely fresh and courageous. Is there any? And please you raise your hand if you would like to intervene, any of you. So I don't see any uh, courageous, uh, none of, to, to my knowledge. There's Timo, I think, Andres. Uh, Timo, right? yeah. Oh, good. Please, Timo. No, no, I, I said all of ah. no, no comments, no questions. I think it was a very comprehensive and, and very good good overview. And I, I really believe it, it reflects some of the things that, we, that we're planning here with, with instruments like, like H2 Global, I think. But we will talk about that later, I assume. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, then maybe at this point, Andres, I just uh, uh, maybe Please. a clarification question for Alejandro, which I see also uh, appearing in the chat. Uh, you talked about clean hydrogen. Um, uh, which technology do you have in mind? Are you uh, talking about only electrolyzers, like uh, hydrogen produced by electrolysis, or also via other forms? Just for clarification. Right. Thank you. So um, we only consider um, hydrogen production with water electrolysis powered by a uh, solar and wind that's that's all we consider for this report okay thanks yeah from our audience uh, just a, a rather simple question uh, uh, that you partially answered it is why germany is today such a big uh, consumer of hydrogen and will it stay forever like a biggest hydrogen consumer and why uh, norway and morocco has uh, such a big potential role in supplying this hydrogen uh, to you ma to your market. Right. Um, thank you. So I, I, I think nobody can know whether Germany will still be such a the largest uh, consumer of hydrogen in 2050. Um, so what we consider is how demand looks today. And we assume it would not look a lot different in 2050. Of course, if uh, other countries um, develop more demand and things could move a little bit. Why Morocco and Norway are play such a big role is because of their vast potential to produce renewable electricity. In the case of Morocco from sun, from the sun, uh, from solar electricity, and in the case of Norway, mainly uh, from wind, uh, wind energy. So because of these reasons, both uh, have this large potential that if they choose to develop, it could produce a lot of renewable hydrogen. Yeah, and the last question from me, uh, Alejandro, 
what do you expect to see in May's Commission's proposal? I mean, what I've, I will simplify your task. You be be deceived not to see something that you see should be there. So you you can choose one or <laughs> one way of answer. Or you see compulsory to be, or you would wish some things would um, be there in Commission's proposal for hydrogen accelerator. Right. I mean, this is a difficult task, but I will say. Um, what I mentioned in a previous presentation of this report um, that the commission could try to facilitate, which is uh, coordination uh, between different European countries. We present three very sharply defined scenarios. Uh, we know reality will be somewhere in between. Um, what we see right now is that if each country goes its own way, there might be inefficiencies and problems as we've seen in the past that might repeat. Um, for this, the Commission has um, a difficult but a very important task of trying to coordinate these efforts, as we uh, were um, discussing sometime before about connections, for example, between countries. This uh, results show that an internal EU market for hydrogen could be very beneficial for the European Union. But for this, the infrastructure has to be there together with regulation and other institutions um, but this will take a lot of time. Um, coordinating, agreeing on which infrastructure to build and then getting it done. So I, I think my hope is that the communication in May could advance a little bit this effort for uh, coordination. So basically trying to do differently compared with renewable electricity where we relied very much on individual country actions and then it comes together that uh, you would expect that efficiencies are so clear that you need to plan immediately the whole EU wide market. So that's uh, as I understand yes. correctly. I think we all have seen the, the maps with the different electricity prices. Um, so I think this is a reminder of the inefficiencies that we have. Uh, everyone could be enjoying a better electricity price if connections were stronger. Thank you, Alejandro. That's really, we have been very lucky to have you here. And uh, the ones that ask for presentations, they will be also online. You could find it on uh, uh, FSR webpage. So if you, it was very rich presentation, a lot of figures, uh, and you would definitely have, a, will, will have definitely a chance to look again. And now I will pass uh, the leadership to Ilaria. Uh, so we'll, <laughs> thank yeah. you, Andres. There was actually, I think, an intervention from Christopher. So uh, I don't know if Christopher wants to uh, say something before we uh, switch to the panel debate. Uh, thanks. It was a question for Alejandro. Right? Um, is, so the, the commissioners proposed that we'll import 10 million tons of renewable hydrogen by 2030 in the repower communication. And obviously you've looked in detail about the ability to import hydrogen, what it means in practical terms. And I, I was looking at what were the existing major projects outside the EU. When you've got the Saudi Arabian project, $5 billion will take five years and will produce 0.2 million tonnes. So my, my question to you is, um, is, I'm not gonna ask the question, is it possible? Because that's the wrong question. Um, on the basis of your examination of the, the international place that we are in terms of hydrogen projects, what needs to be done by the Commission in May to actually make this happen? Because it's not, obviously not going to happen on its own. Because the Saudi Arabian project is going to take five or six years, cost $5 billion, uh, and we'll produce 0.2 million tonnes if we need 50 times that, is that right, something like that, uh, or 20 times that, no, 50 times that, then the EU is going to have to do a hell of a lot in order to get that ready by 2030. So what, what in your experience, would the, the EU need to do to make that a reality? Thank you. That's a, that's a very important question. I think the 10 million tonnes goal is very ambitious and the time is very short. So... I will just uh, go back to one of our implications. Um, there has to be decisions very shortly, I don't know, May or at least rather soon on where this hydrogen might come from and how. 
because once this decision is done, which is not an easy one, uh, we will have, or the European Union will have to develop the infrastructure to bring it and to produce it. And we are in April, 2022. This uh, gives eight years. Um, so I would say the first task would be to clarify where this could come from um, and how it could reach um, European um, hydrogen consumers and from there support the development of the necessary infrastructure, um, providing or lowering this uh, risk, providing as much certainty as possible to the developers that yes, we are serious with this target and will uh, support you to get there uh, on time. I think it's a, it's a very um, big task and the time is very short. I don't know if it's possible or not, um, but um, I think this is the, the, the to do from from the commission and the member state. So, thank you, Alejandro. Now, Vilaria. Yes, um, I have to. You can't refuse. <laughs> <laughs> I can't escape anymore. Okay, very good. No, but it was very interesting, also very challenging questions. And thank you, Alejandro, for a very good presentation. Now it's time for the panel debate. And as Andres just announced in the introduction, we have three distinguished speakers, which uh, will help us understanding, you know, making a sort of reality check of uh, where we are uh, on hydrogen development and what are the uh, perspectives also for the uh, medium and, uh, and long term. And uh, I have the pleasure of introducing them to you. We have uh, Yorgo Chatsimarkakis, uh, CEO of Hydrogen Europe, you know, the European wide association uh, in the, in the, in, on the industry side for hydrogen. Uh, we have Timo Bollehe uh, from H2 Global Stiftung, so it's a foundation uh, in Germany uh, where um, he, uh, in this foundation, is for the protection of environment and climate, and he's the managing director. And then we have Roland Roche from uh, Irina, deputy director of Innovation and the Technology Center there uh, at uh, the International. Uh, Renewable Energy Agency. Welcome very much to all of you and thank you for being with us. Um, I would proceed in this order, so uh, in the, the order I introduced you, um, so starting with Yorko for uh, a small um, reaction also to the study by Alejandro. Please, Yorko. Many thanks for the invitation and also many thanks for this uh, very, very interesting presentation and the study, Alejandro. Um, I really can share many of your um, findings there and figures. I also would like to thank Kitty because, um, I mean, you stand here for the commission and I, I have to admit that Repower EU from 8th of March, the first proposal now being followed up by uh, an action list 18th of May is a great achievement. I mean, this was also courageous. And I would like to pick this one figure of the 20 million tons um, of hydrogen to be produced to translate it into what needs to be done um, to give it, a, as Ilaria said, it a, a reality check. Now, 20 million tons means, in terms of electrolyzer capacity, 320 gigawatt. Um, that is much more than the 40 gigawatt that were in our strategy, but it's also more than a factor of 100 compared to the scale we have so far. We have at the moment globally roughly three gigawatt of electrolyzer capacity. So within eight years, we need to scale up from three to 320. So everybody can understand, Alejandro alluded to it, that this is quite a challenge. The first step, and again, we, we approached <clears throat> the commission and we are very glad that uh, Commissioner Breton accepted to organize under the auspices of the European Clean Hydrogen Alliance, some, something which I would call an electrolyzer summit. So we need, bottom line is we need to create something like the battery alliance for electrolyzers. Uh, we will meet next week with 20 CEOs of the electrolyzer business. Uh, the good news is it's quite European. So Europeans are dominating massively the scene. My hope is, Kitty, I will come back to you. My hope is that we will not do the same mistakes we did with the PV industry, photovoltaic industry, some 10 years ago, uh, and not use this opportunity 
as Europeans. And I, I, I really speak here as not only as a representative of the hydrogen sector, but also as a, I would say, as a proud, proud European. Now, there are other elements in this accelerator that are super, super important. One is the so-called um, Mediterranean Hydrogen Partnership, which basically is, um, I would say, a partnership between uh, Europe, the Middle East, and the whole of Africa. Uh, we have seen the map that Alejandro presented. So Africa in his whole, uh, the whole continent will be one of the powerhouses uh, of hydrogen production, not only for exports. We talked about Germany as, a, as, a, as in the, the always importer, but also for the internal production and very, very importantly, for uh, bringing parts of the whole value chain to Africa. I give you one example, which is iron ore production and the DRI, the direct reduction of iron ore with hydrogen. You can do it in Europe, but then you need to import the iron ore and the green hydrogen. Why don't we do it where the iron ore comes from, Mauritania, and where we can produce cheapest hydrogen in the world, and then um, import only pellets? So this partnership is not only important for um, the climate and for imports, but also for the development and not development aid. Uh, Andres knows exactly what I'm talking. He was energy commissioner and later on, he also had the responsibility for development aid. It's about development. It's giving parts of the value chain to this continent and to become real partners. I'm saying that also vis-a-vis uh, -vis the COP27, which will be in Egypt. Uh, and we need as Europeans not to put, you know, uh, figures, money, action where, where our mouth is. I would like to add another dimension that, that was not on the map of Alejandro, but needs to be on the map 18th of May. That's Ukraine. And I'm crystal clear here. We had yesterday a board meeting of Hygiene Europe together, and we had exchange with the foreign minister Kuleba and with um, energy minister to understand what is going on there. We are trying to help to build up an agency for hydrogen in Kiev. We are employing now Ukrainian, it's ladies, Ukrainian uh, um, employees uh, in Brussels to educate and to bring them later on back to uh, Kiev uh, to be the core, the nucleus of an agency that does the recovery of the country in hydrogen terms. Uh, I think H2 Global, uh, and Timo will talk about that later on, was also actively involved by setting up uh, a German office in, in Kiev. We need to liaise that. Bottom line here is, Ukraine has the potential to become the role model of a hydrogen economy. It's sarcastic to say that the destruction of the country, of course, makes that possible. It, I don't like to say it, but let's then really help each other. So it's good for us to see how a perfect hydrogen economy could look like by retrofitting and repurposing the pipeline system, the electrolyzer production, the renewable production. I don't want to hide that also nuclear production in Ukraine is there. No? It is existing, it's huge, uh, and it will also be part of that picture, to be, to be clear. And um, I expect that there will be a partnership not only with uh, Mediterranean, but also with Ukraine in this uh, recovery, in, in this repower EU. And I would like to add also one point that, which is not yet there, but when the electrolyzer people need, meet next week, the first question they ask us is, who is the uptaker? Who will then take this hydrogen and, and, and consume it? Uh, Kitty, uh, you mentioned, and Alejandro, the 5.6 uh, million tons that are in the targets of renewable energy directive. That's now we are quadrupling. We have heard today from um, uh, Daimler Trucks in, 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 a, in a panel that they expect between five and 10 million tons for liquid hydrogen for, for trucks. That's a great figure. I'm not sure whether we can achieve that, but that's, that's already something we, we have. Let's, let's put 5 million tons here. We would propose another 5 million tons for a strategic energy reserve. What does that mean? Um, we have in, in our legislation every October to fill up the 
gas reserves by 80% every November by 90%, which is fine. Congratulations to the commission here. We need to add a hydrogen reserve here. We can use salt caverns or any caverns for that. And we would count on 5 million tons here as well. It's the member states buying that. It could be the EIB being the buyer on behalf of the member states. They own it. They can do what, whatever they want uh, later on. They can use it in different sectors. But that would give us a planability. And that would give the whole market, the, the market making mechanism that we need until 2030. Um, then we should refrain from excluding sectors because once hydrogen, here I start to criticize a little bit, Kitty, uh, because you said, yeah, it should go to industry first. Yeah, true. But once we do replace gas and we do that with hydrogen, we cannot say, okay, uh, any other sector like heating can start in, in 35. Why? There are brilliant European producers of boilers that can use hydrogen already in the heating sector, and they urgently need a market. And we are the market. Europe should be the market. We should not uh, exclude that. Um, I'm saying all that because there are, Alejandro mentioned clearly, we should remove uh, commercialization barriers. And these are barriers if you exclude certain markets or, now I would like to, to speak uh, one second about the Delegated Act, if we impose very complex formal uh, things on, um, on this uh, sector. We can do that, Kitty. We can do that, dear European Commission. But please, let us first create the volume. We are in a war situation now. Um, and it will be additional renewable capacity, that's for sure. Please make it complex after 2030. But leave us, build this nascent market up until 20, uh, 2030 in, in order to get there. Uh, one last word. Um, I think we are, at, as Europeans, um, best placed to, to, become, um, to become here the strongest in the electrolyzer business, but we have also to look at the WTO rules with a different eye. Why am I saying that? Uh, I stay with Morocco because Alejandro has mentioned Morocco as one of the future giants. Do we want to use the climate contract for difference, which is one part also of the accelerator and H2 Global was very instrumental in putting that forward. Do we want to use that state aid for Chinese electrolyzers in Morocco? Or do we want to have a European electrolyzer production? I'm saying that because I would say we need to have a mechanism whereby 100% um, of this climate contract for difference would go to a European production, be it in Mauritania, be it in Egypt, be it in, in Morocco. And it could, should not be 100% if it is not a European electrolyzer. Uh, having said that, I think um, lot, lot, lots of congratulations, some criticism, happy to discuss. Thank you, Andres. And thank you, Ilaria. Many thanks. Thank you to you, uh, Yorgo. Um, differently from what I said, I was meanwhile informed that uh, we have some time constraints from one of the speakers. So, Timo, I'm sorry, I will have to give the floor to uh, Roland first, if you don't mind, because he will have to leave us soon. So, Roland, we will turn to you. Yes, yeah, thank you very much. And thank you very much for the, the invitation from Mr. P. Bikes and the FSR Secretariat to present to, to kind of uh, contribute here in this event and, and to make uh, statements on the study that has been pre presented by Alejandro and also to reflect on the contribution from the other speakers. In general, I have to say, I'm very happy to say that the, the results of the, the EU hydrogen accelerators and what has been presented here is very much in line what also the International Renewable Energy Agency uh, sees. Um, I'm, my name is, is Roland Rösch and I'm, I'm a Deputy Director of the Innovation and Technology Center of IRENA. And in the past uh, five years, we did a lot of work on hydrogen and this hydrogen work we did at IRENA is very much in line with what Mr. Alejandro has presented. And um, what we see, why, why is there this interest in hydrogen? And we clearly see, let's say that the falling cost of renewable energy power generation is here the driving force. 
Further, let's say uh, hydrogen is for IRENA seen from a renewable energy perspective, mainly a clean um, uh, um, energy carrier. And it depends of what power you use uh, in the electrolyzer to produce this uh, clean uh, energy carrier. So if you use renewable energy, then you have green hydrogen, which is a, is a um, green and sustainable energy carrier. And let's say this opens a lot of possibilities to make connections that have been discussed also in the past to connect markets and to bring renewable energy from markets that are not connected via grids. And so in this sense, there is a possibility to connect market and to transport renewable energies from, from continents. And it makes very much sense of what has been said to make a connection between the European market, to build a Mediterranean ring of hydrogen, to connect the markets and the countries, neighbor countries of the Mediterranean with uh, Europe, with the European um commit with the European Union and to have a trade here of hydrogen. It is, uh, let's say also hydrogen is very important as an energy carrier to decarbonize, uh, let's say the energy sector and the end use sectors in areas where you cannot use electrification. And there we see that hydrogen is extremely important. It opens, hydrogen opens an interesting transition pathway also for today's oil and gas exporting countries. And now with the Ukraine crisis and the possibility that for instance, Germany is investigating with, um, with the countries in the Middle East to start now to export, let's say basically to import to Europe and Germany um, hydrogen, blue hydrogen first, and then moving it to green hydrogen is clearly here the option that is on the table. And this pathway can be handled with the energy carrier hydrogen. So also what is important here is the falling renewable electricity cost that support a strong case, a strong business case also for green hydrogen. What we see, and you can find this in our, in our green hydrogen electrolyzer the report, <clears throat> you see the main driving force for the green hydrogen production is, of course, the price for cheap, uh, cheap um, electricity. And the other driving force here is the cost, the capex of the electrolyzers. Unfortunately, by now, the, the capex of the electrolyzers are still very high, but in very nice places with a high solar radiation or with very good wind conditions, you can already produce um, um, green hydrogen, which is fully competitive to fossil fuel based produced hydrogen. And let's say looking into the favorite environment in seeing the costs of renewable energies coming more down and with a growing market in connecting Africa and the European Union also through a Mediterranean ring kind of creates the scale, the effects of scales, which are needed to, to use the best places in Africa with very favorable um, environment for the production of cheap uh, renewable power, and then to find the scaling up possibilities to bring down the electrolyzer costs, which makes uh, green hydrogen production and the, the export from Africa to Europe of green hydrogen uh, very, early on and not only in 2050, maybe even from 2035 onwards, this may be possible. But of course, there are some aspects 
that we see as from from an renewable energy agency perspective as very important firstly let's say we need to have national hydrogen strategies in african countries in the gcc and in the european union that have to match together so a coordination of the strategies and of the plans is important and irena stands by to help to coordinate the plans to make hydrogen trading happen and that uh, the different visions which exist the road roadmaps and the strategies let's say by the time match together that uh, let's say this vision can become reality we see clearly clearly that a governance system and enabling policies are needed that support this uh, roadmaps and strategy for green hydrogen production uh, it is very important and that this is a key um, a key topic for irena guarantees of origin and certification uh, of green hydrogen is very important we have to see where the hydrogen is coming from how it has been produced uh, we also have to avoid that countries in africa produce renewable energy with this they produce green hydrogen and export this green hydrogen to europe by they kind of um, increase the production of uh, power coming from fossil fuels in their own countries is a thing we have to to be to be sure that let's say this is not happening and that the hydrogen that is traded is coming from an origin which is renewable and maybe only in a in a over um, coming phase is starting with blue hydrogen and and uh, sustainable hydrogen coming from uh, sources and uh, low co2 emission blue hydrogen also very important is to uh, Roland could i ask you to to, Roland? to move forward with this hello so i'm, I'm closing here you can okay. find more Perfect. information <laughs> uh, at irena and our reports referring to this thank you Okay, sorry, Roland. I was not sure you could hear me, but I would, would have asked you to conclude no, no, one minute. The, but the points I wanted to make, uh, we are very aligned with the study that has been presented. The only concern was that a certain infrastructure, certain policies, guarantees of origin and certification is needed to, to make sure we get the right way of, of combining and, and, and creating markets for green hydrogen. Thank Absolutely. you very much. Many thanks to you, Roland, indeed. And I, would, I, I was noticing Timo was also taking notes when you were talking about certification and guarantees of origin. So I expect uh, maybe some comments also on that. But Timo, thank you for your patience. And uh, yes, you now have the floor. Um, I know you have some slides, right? So let's- Well, I can, you. maybe I just- oh. I, 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 I skip As you prefer. Slides. Maybe we just, just do it like this. Well, first of all, also Alejandro, once again, congratulations to this very good report. And it really reflects and underpins a lot of the, the reasons why H2 Global has been created. Uh, because we, we have really that, that chicken and egg situation at the moment where we need to start investing now. And we've seen the, the huge, let, let's say, hurdles and, and program that we have ahead of us if we want to reach these targets 2030, 2050. It is very clear, the public side, but also the private sector made it very clear. Yes, we want to reach those targets, but we don't have the time to wait until a market is being sort of created the natural no way. We need to start investing today. We can't wait another five years, another 10 years until sort of demand and pricing and, and supply have sort of met in, in, in a normal market environment where then a normal market ramp up would take place. Um, we also have that huge, let's say, challenge from an investor's point of view, where we have that huge back gap in pricing at the moment between, let's say, production costs and the pricing that you could achieve for a green product in the market. 
whether it's pure hydrogen or also hydrogen derivatives like ammonia, for example, which is a little bit of an odd case at the moment due to the current market turbulences, but let's say uh, prospectively things will hopefully normalize again. So that's exactly where instruments like H2 Global come in to provide an investment security and investment case today. So that allows you know, investors, consortiums to start investing now. We've seen all these big announcements about MOUs, about the huge gigawatts that are being played or, uh, uh, planned all over the world. But if you look into the detail, you will see this is still a lot of, let's say, looking, looking ahead to the future until the time is there that they really can start investing. There is not a real single investment being taken place as, as we speak. And that's exactly where instruments like H2 Global come into place because we want to provide this investment certainty now by taking out all the pricing risk or the regulatory risk. And that's, uh, uh, Larry, you mentioned, I was making notes when we talked about, you know, certification, about standardization, or there's a huge insecurity in the market. What is green now? Nobody knows really. What is the definition of green? What is the standard of green? What is the certification of green? Even worse, if you say, what is the definition of green looking down the line? What is green in 2080, uh, 2028, in 2030? If I start you know, investing now large scale into the production and into a definition of green, I need to be sure that whatever I produce now, I can also you know, bring it into the market five years, eight years down the line as a green product, being able to achieve that green premium that is needed. On top, we have the decreasing pricing situation in regard to the electrolyzer. At the moment, this is low or like garage factory, you know, megawatt scale. If we want to go into the gigawatt scale, things prices will hopefully decrease dramatically. Another reason why nobody would start investing now, everybody would say, oh, wait another three years, five years down the line, when the electrolyzers maybe cost, I don't know, 30, 35% less. And that is why we need instruments like, like you know, H. Lowe said, to, to take out that, that insecurity by providing long-term offtake agreements with an absolutely blue-chip government-backed offtaker. That is more, in a, more or less in, in, in a core what H2 Global does at the moment. And I think another very important aspect, Jorgi, you just mentioned it, you know, the, the recent developments in regards to you know, security reserves of, 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 uh, of power, which will also, you know, play a vital role in the, in the matter of hydrogen going, going down the line. I think this becomes a very interesting aspect when we talk about switching into a hydrogen economy. It's not, no longer only about greening the economy. It's really about providing political stability, security, independency. Uh, and I think hydrogen plays a very interesting role in or provides the opportunity to diversify away from, let's say, the usual subjects. Uh, also, if we might have the opportunity to say, okay, are there areas, uh, regions in the world which are already sort of high exporters of energy? Can we diversify away from, there, from them? I assume these regions will also play a vital role in regards to hydrogen, but hydrogen also provides the opportunity to diversify into Africa, into Latin America, and to other parts of the world. So that's a, a huge, a huge opportunity, which I see, and I think um, uh, the, the, the current situation, the crisis situation that we have at the moment, will play, you know, will give it a huge, huge push that that hydrogen will will, will become vital here. Um, I think when we look into how do we achieve these really ambitious targets that we need to achieve, when we look at Alejandro's numbers here. Um, and also looking into instruments like H2 Global, where they can play a role also on a European level. I think we've got the, the huge opportunity at the moment that we have this instrument in place. H2 Global at the moment is focusing on import outside of the Europe, outside of Europe, into Europe, into Germany. But in principle, the, the, the same mechanism works within Europe production offtake within Europe, even within certain countries, you can apply the same concept. Why is it importing into Europe, into Germany at the moment, outside of Europe? It's simply the fact that the funds, this uh, 1 billion euros that were made available by the German government, they were programmed for the importation of hydrogen. But the similar concept could always be applied also into, into let's say, setting up an inner European window. We call it the window logic. And H2 Global works like a like a modular system, you can provide, you know, you can provide different funds specified for different 
windows that could be set up under H2 Global uh, under, under that mechanism, under that instrument. At the moment, it's not only for the import. This could be additional funds coming from Germany, but also as a European instrument. I think Jorge, that's where we're looking into how we can use H2 Global as an instrument on a European level. It's also already clearly mentioned in the coalition agreement by the German government. Let's just see this as a starting point. It's the Germans now giving the first 900 million, but let's develop this further into, into European uh, 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 um, instrument that we can use to address European independency, uh, but also European imports at large scale, what is clearly needed when I look into, into the numbers that Alejandro just mentioned. Maybe just as a, as a nutshell where we, we stand at the moment, and um, I think in regards to the, to the reserves, uh, uh, a situation that we have at the moment. We just last week we signed an, an MOU also with THE, which is the the market. What's the English word for it? Your know, market, marktgebietsverantwortlicher in Germany, market regulatory. Uh, he, the, the twelve TSOs there they're operating the the THE, which is sort of coordinating all the the gas pipelines uh, coordinations. This could be become a vital, you know, instrument for example in regards to providing reserve capacity when we use hydrogen hydrogen derivatives like ammonia also as a as an energy reserve in the future so we need we need to think a little bit out of the boxes now and start uh, to 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 try to create that that hydrogen market and that hydrogen economy also in regards to strategic reserve management i believe maybe that in a nutshell from from my side Wonderful. Thanks a lot, Timo. Um, I see Andres has raised. Yeah, his hand. I wanted to ask Timo because I like the model. I think it's good starting model. But what are the weaknesses of your model? So, well, you should know better than uh, somebody from outside what you would consider that could be done differently. Let's assume in Europe, on European level, this model is replicated in a way. So, what you would say? need it additionally be considered or you don't see anything uh, that needs to be done differently? Well, maybe what can be done differently, I can tell you in a couple of months when we've sort of conducted our first auctions and we, we will have our lessons learned. But maybe sometimes there's, I wouldn't call it criticism, but there's, you know, the, the question, okay, but if we have, because we have this divergence in, in tenors, we have 10 year offtake agreements that we, we uh, offer, but we only have short term sales agreements uh, uh, within the H global model. Um, that obviously is a challenge for, let's say, the steel, uh, the steel industry, where they say, if we, you know, invest now at large scale into direct reduction, we need to ensure and we would like to secure, I don't know, 10, 15 years offtake agreements on that side as well. This is something that H Global in the model as we see it now is not providing. We're already in, in discussions about how we can come up with, let's say, different models to also address long-term offtake agreements on the sales side of the model. Um, but that is something that we're, we're working on at the moment. But in the in the current situation, it's also very important because what H Global is trying also to conduct is we're missing any of any real pricing signals in the market. That's that's a big problem. Also, when we want to use CCFD or CFD mechanisms, we are lacking pricing signals neither on the production or on the on on the on the market price. This is what we need to create before we can maybe then evolve into a classical CFD mechanism. Um, but that is maybe some some things where, where we sometimes have the questions, but we, we need long term offtake agreements, can you do this also under the model in principle, yes, but not under the current first round of options that we're conducting. Okay, great. I think this leads us to the end of the panel debate. I want to thank very much all the panelists, uh, Jorgo Chatsimarkakis, Timo Bollerhe and Roland Roche as well. The, I think you really um, built on Alejandro's study and contributed with really great uh, input. So thank you very much. And I give the floor now to Christopher, to our Christopher Jones for the conclusions. Um, thank you. But before I give any conclusions, because I have five minutes left, um, can I offer to give the floor to Kitty to see if there's any remarks that you would like to make? Um, surprise you on that one. If, if the answer is no, that's fine. I can talk for five minutes. <laughs> that's my style, Christopher. <laughs> Actually, thanks a lot, uh, Christopher, because I, I really wanted to react on, 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 on just uh, one thing that Yorgo said. 
and that's um, that's this statement that we that one would exclude any sectors. So I would just like to say we are nobody is excluding any sectors from hydrogen. No sector is excluded. The question is when you have scarce public resources, where do you channel them? So of course we have chosen those sectors to channel the public funding, which are the, the um, most efficient, where the highest need is, where there are no other alternatives. And we would leave those sectors where we see different technological solutions will compete, we would leave those to the market. Right now, I agree with you that even in those sectors, hydrogen for the moment is not competitive, but let, the, let for the moment the, the market play out. So we are not excluding any sectors. It's just that when we need to focus our policies and, and public funding on sectors, we like to do that on the ones that are most, uh, most efficient and, and most promising. So maybe that's just in the clarification. And then on the Delegated Act, that's going to be part actually of the, of the 18th of May package. So it's going to come out and be published for public feedback. So it's not going to be adopted. It's just the start of the public consultation, which is very, very important because we really want to get stakeholders feedback on that. Just one word on that. Let's keep in mind that that, that delegated act again does not tell electrolyzers when they have to run when they should not run. It merely says if you run it these times, you're producing renewable. If you're running at those times, you're producing low carbon or actually emitting uh, hydrogen. So that's what the delegated act does. I agree that then, of course, all the subsidy schemes that comes from different areas will have an influence on that, but the delegated act is tasked to do, not to prevent electrolyzers from running at the times they want to run, but to qualify when that electrolyzer is producing truly renewable electricity and where it isn't. But we'll have uh, lots of occasions to discuss this uh, once the draft is out for public official public consultation. And we really en encourage every stakeholder to send us their comments so that we can, we can continue the work into final adoption. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Kitty. If we had more time, 50% of the audience could criticize you in advance for not being strict enough with the um, criteria and the additionality, and 50% could criticize you for being too strict, depending on which audience you have, and that's that's often the problem. Um, I think my job is simply to say thank you to um, the speakers, particularly Alejandro. I, I remember Professor Ronnie Bellman saying about a year and a half ago in relation to the hydrogen market, so many opinions and so little knowledge. Um, and I, I think today's debate has shown how far we've moved along in 18 months, um, because today's debate was all about facts and knowledge. And I thought the ones that Alejandro um, put forward, which were, were, were extremely well done and clearly objective, showed us, I think, two things. Um, one is the importance of getting the balance between imports and domestic production right. Because the numbers that, that he proposed or, or put out, which is you have differences of 2.7 euros or dollars, I can't remember, um, a kilo and 4.7, when you upscale that to 20 billion, gives you 34 billion euros a year. So it's, it's really important that there's an... European internal market for hydrogen that expands wider than simply the European Union, that includes imports as well. And the second one um, is, so the second thing that, that Jorgo mentioned, which I think is really important, which we often forget, is for crying out loud, let's not make the same mistake in relation to hydrogen electrolyzers who were made with BVs. I understand that already there are Chinese electrolyzers being sold in the European Union, and this makes absolutely no sense. For, let, let's not do this again. Let's make sure we get that right. And I know, for example, Ameri America um, is imposing domestic production requirements in relation to subsidized renewables. So food, food for thought, as it were. Um, and third, the, the huge importance of what, um, what Timo and his team is doing and Kitty will need to be doing in terms of making the 10 million tons imported hydrogen work. Because a simplistic uh, extrapolation, the Saudi Arabian project is 5 billion for 0 
billion tons. That means we're going to need 250 billion in investment over the next three years if we have a chance to meet that. So th this is in all, it's, it's not at all impossible, but it's extremely challenging. So I'd like to thank really very much indeed everybody. This was one of the best debates I've ever seen in hydrogen.